Results in Cups. Porig, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me on. No bother at all. The first thing that popped into my head, I had a string of potential first questions for you about your own fitness, about this opening weekend against Galway, uh, about potentially last year, but you popped up on screen and my first thought was, what happened to hair? And, uh, got, a, got, a, got a new look. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, I got, got, rid of the, got rid of the long hair just a few weeks ago, so took part in one of the Locks for Loves fundraisers for Laurel Inn and um, gave, it the, gave it the chop. Fair play. Uh, was there any kind of fear of a Samson-esque kind of uh, reaction to the haircut that you might lose it all was your mentioned. powers? Yeah, it was mentioned. I don't have that many powers anyway to begin with, so I don't have the whole to lose, but yeah, look, it, not too bad. It could have been a lot bad. worse. Listen, you're in a better state uh, on that front than I will ever be, so I can't really throw stones in that <laughs> regard. Uh, so fair play, and it was all for charity too. I have to ask you, I, I was going to congratulate you, obviously, and Mayo generally on the FBD League win there last weekend, or last Friday night against Roscommon, but you weren't involved. I believe you're carrying a knock. Is that true? Yeah, I'm hiding away from the preseason. I'm afraid of hard work. You don't want to go um, near the air dome, that's the thing. No, no, I don't believe in it. Um, but yeah, look, it was good. It was a good start to the season for for us in general. But yeah, carrying a wee bit of a knock. Got a little bit of work done just prior to Christmas. So all is good, actually, in fairness. I'm tipping away lovely. Um, fitness will come come along in the coming weeks. But I uh, won't see the weekend, unfortunately, now. But we'll just uh, tip away. You're, when are you hoping to come in? Because I know obviously we've got Galway coming up this weekend and then there's matches against Armagh and then Kerry are on the horizon then soon after that as well. What are you kind of targeting week two, week three? Not targeting anything actually. Okay. I am um, I just went when I suppose I had to get uh, the bit of work and stuff. I kind of made a plan with the, with the medical team that was like just tell me what I'm doing tomorrow and the day after because I, I find it a little bit easier. Um it just makes more sense in my head than worrying about a date and getting frustrated or trying to measure whether I was getting there or not getting there. So they're taking good care of me and like I said, I'm actually I'm feeling really good. So You're kind of that, well. you're kind of that creature anyway, whereby you don't have you don't make plans in the future, you don't think about that third and fourth game on the horizon. You're very much a next training session, next man kind of game kind of guy. Yeah, maybe for the betterment or the detriment <laughs> of myself, I don't know, be that in life. Or in sports, but yeah, that's that's how I'm made up. I think. Does that drive coaches mad that you don't? That they they would view some might view that as as a lack of preparation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for you, it's just literally how you you best approach a game and how you best optimize your performance. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. You know, some things you just do subconsciously. I suppose just mm. like how you've kind of grown up or whatever. I've been in sports, sports team, and individual sports all my life and I just I don't know that's just how I found over the years kind of makes me comfortable and it's the way I go about my business you know it's good on the good days when you you have a cracking game and you you think yeah I've got it on point and then other days you go out and get absolutely roasted and you're thinking well maybe I should have looked yeah. at the, the player a little bit more or whatever it's so it all depends on the result but like that's just the way we go about our business have the fitness issues with yourself kind of affected how you have uh, interacted with the new management structure there in place with Mayo because obviously we've had Kevin McStay come on board along with Stephen Rochford and his all-star cast I guess of, of his backroom team has that affected how you've kind of integrated into that new setup yet I don't think so no um, like I'm still around the place all the time still at uh, as good as every training session I'm not I suppose I'm not out there performing I'm not staking claim in that regard but I'm definitely there thereabouts you know bouncing around still engaging with guys and stuff and there's as you know in the intercounty setup there's a lot done kind of off the field too Yeah. so look I there's no getting away from it I missed a little bit of training um, will I be a week or two behind people of course in um, regards to fitness and stuff but those things you can catch up on you can work hard on so um, yeah, we'll just we we'll see how it goes there, but don't don't see it as a as a major issue. How has the change been? How have you found it so far? How is the difference between uh, what was under James Horan uh, initially for yourself and now under the new manager and Kevin McStay? How's it, how's the change been for yourself? I only ever really knew um, Mayo under James Horan. Yeah. Really, you know, I done like a couple of months prior to that. But I mean, <laughs> really, too, all I ever knew was was James, and like I enjoyed it under James. There, it was good. It was good setup. It's a uh, good place to be it's you know you've just got good people around you and um, so it's it's a nice place to be and you're privileged to be there and now with the new management it's class it's just exciting it's giddy you know there's you know change and change brings that kind of excitement there I think 
everybody is got a pep in their step. There's a fire burning for guys coming in. You would feel that everybody's been given a very much clean slate. There's no real pecking order per se, you know, so mm. it's there to be taken, I think. And that generates, I suppose, competition, internal competition, and that generates good performance really doesn't it mm. does that change the level of pressure that's on the squad because obviously you know if everybody's going to have their own sense of fighting for a place in the starting 15 or fighting for a place in the in the match day panel but the uh, sense of outside pressure gets relieved when you get a new management structure like that brought in that you just concentrate on looking after your own game and impressing the new boss I guess I don't know uh, I don't know how everybody else views it but like the team is Mayo still Mayo Mayo will be there no matter what players or management team you know will outlast us all so like objectively for me it's about succeeding with Mayo um, and performing with Mayo so don't don't see it as an individual basis of trying to you know shine or perform or anything in that regard it's like I think it's a, it's a good place to be mm. Um, what's the, the the kind of structure of the management been like? Because I, I, it's it's clearly different in in personnel, obviously enough. But I think in structure, there's a sense that things are a little bit different there in, in how uh, Kevin has set about different tasks and different areas for people to kind of specialize in in terms of the coaching. Give us a sense of what that's like. Um, from yeah, from my perspective, it's it's very very professional. Kevin has come in and. It's very, very well laid out. It's well structured. It makes sense if, if you know, in, in very simple terms. I think Kevin's got a military background. I think he knows how to, to manage and how to function and operate a, a unit or a team. And it looks it looks really, really good. Um, I know my place in it. I think everybody else knows, you know, where, where we're going, what we're doing and why we're doing it. So by all accounts, yeah, like it's really, really good. And you mentioned the element of, of clean slate and that's, I guess, brilliant for everybody because there's no kind of baggage being hung over for, for any reason uh, whatsoever from previous years. As regards yourself, uh, were you happy with how last year finished? Clearly, like, you're not going to be happy going out when Mayo did at that part of the championship in the quarterfinals. But uh, for yourself, you had been involved, I guess, obviously in, through the league and in that league final against Kerry and then up to you started that game against Goa in the Connacht Championship and then you had to content yourself with, I guess, with a, with a substitutes role. Was that as a result of what had taken place with Shane Walsh and Galway or was it just a case of James at the time felt like a, a change was needed in defence and you were kind of the face that didn't fit? I don't know actually we never really had a major conversation around it um, as a player you always yeah. you always want to start you know you, of course you do um, you, you want to be in the starting 15 um, I felt that I was actually going quite well last year had a few good games had a few slightly shakier games, yeah. nature of the beast, I suppose. But um, I don't really know kind of where it went from there. We played Galway in the first round. Um, again, actually, probably a relatively decent game on a personal level. Um, really, uh, not obviously not great then on, on a team level, which is far more important. It was um, it wasn't a great start. And from there on, I was I just didn't didn't make it into that starting fifteen. And like it's unbelievably competitive to get a jersey a green and red jersey is very very hard come by no matter how good you are mm. or how well you're going it is it's a serious challenge and i suppose management make calls based on what they see or what they want or what they think and like i suppose you're not really there to challenge them you're there to do what you can from the team like yeah that defensive unit has always been fairly strong i think and depth wise it's always been there you've got people like Stephen Cohen and Rory Brickenden and all that who mightn't necessarily have been guaranteed starters but are you know, brilliant footballers in and of their, their own rights and then yourself in there as well but I'm interested to see there was no feedback from James as regards why you were kind of benched or anything like that or you, did you seek it out or is are you the kind of person who does seek out those kind of explanations from a manager? Yeah, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't place any blame on, on him in regards to feedback or anything like that yeah. to be honest he was fairly good if you, if you went chatting and stuff and I don't know, some people are into it, some people aren't. I would always maybe seek clarification if I was unclear or something. But to be honest, uh, at the time, it wasn't it wasn't really the place or time for it there. It was mm. trying to do what you can, keep training hard. And like, I would be a firm believer of that kind of action, speak louder than words. You can go and ask questions or you can just put your head down. And like, if you're not starting, you're probably not playing well enough, you know, regardless of how you feel. So 
Okay, that would be my objective would be, okay, if he doesn't think I'm good enough this weekend, then I need to go and show him over the next two or three sessions that I am, you know, and I suppose that's the, that'd be my approach anyway. Things have changed, obviously, in the interim since that, that quarterfinal loss. Um, obviously, Lee has decided in the last few weeks to, to step away, Lee Keegan. Uh, we've also seen Oshie and Mullen head off down for Australia. Did you have conversations with either one of them before their respective decisions were made to, to ply their fail, ply their trades, ply their fields elsewhere? Not really. Like I would have been probably uh, a bit closer to Lee than, than Oshie and maybe um, myself and Lee done that kind of bit for from November mm. and so was with the kids and stuff and we just probably, you know, would have a, a, a good kind of relationship there. Oshin is um, an incredible character and I think Australia will suit him. I think he could put his hand to anything, that lad. I, I genuinely think he could. You know, he, he, he's fantastic and I think he'll have a great time down there. It does leave a bit of a gap, of course, it does losing the two guys. Um, but like the depth of Mayo, you know, um, as I said, it's incredibly hard to get that jersey. You're going to take them two two lads out of the equation this year. It will still be incredibly hard for anybody to pull a jersey um, in that back six and in the starting fifteen. So like the boots are left there and they're left there for somebody else to fill. Um, we'll see who does it. You know there are, there are people champing, absolutely champing at the bit for it. Yeah, I get the sense that rather than people viewing within the panel either one of them as a loss, and indeed they are a loss people view it more in the aspect of this has chummed the waters for competition for places there and that suddenly Lee Keegan's jersey is available, suddenly Oshie Mullen's jersey is available and, and the people that are vying for those spots are doubly determined now to grab hold of them and, and to keep them throughout the course of the league and the championship this year. Yeah, I'd agree with you. It, it is, of course, on a face value, you might see it as a loss, but as you've explained well there, the impact of it there's a lot of positives from that mm. you do you really do have and there's a lot of young, young lads kind of come in it's even put a pep in my step you know it you know lee has lee was a, a huge character around so was Oshin, but you know lee in particular would have been a, a real leader and we have loads and loads of them we're fortunate but like it does it it maybe you're going to demand a little bit more yourself again this year to try and maybe make up that ground or whatever it does to the psyche but there's definitely going to be huge huge competition to try and fill them boots. Mm. On, on the idea of uh, pressure and competition and all that, did, do Mayo get viewed too harshly from an outside of Mayo kind of spotlight and that there's always the sense, you look back in 21 with that final defeat to Tyrone and different opportunities that have come Mayo's way with regards finals, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that they haven't taken chances that have come their way and that they've left stuff on the table that was there for them before. Do you have that sense within the squad or as a player on your own? No, not really. Like I think seasons, I suppose games go the way they go, and so so the seasons and look opportunities afford themselves. Yeah, sometimes you take them, sometimes they're taken from you. Mm. But I think the external uh, external noise is, I don't know, is it just a bit of a? It, it, it suits media, it suits people, it grabs headlines, it gets a bit of attention, it it riles things up a little bit, and I think it's just kind of used objectively outside of the group, mm. but. In regards to the internal kind of view of it all, um, I don't think we see it that way. Um, a lot again, the, the team is so dynamic; it's chopping and changing. A lot of the guys that played that year in the semi-final against Dublin and then final against Tyrone, um, some of them had lost to Dublin six, seven years in a row. Others had never played them, you know. So, and that's again this year it, it, because it's so dynamic and it changes. I suppose the team is constantly developing and changing. Like it, it's not a sense that, that that stuff kind of seeps in because we were talking to Joe Canning on the show last night and he was saying that he was very much a person who if he came across a kind of a quote or a story from somebody who had made a comment against Galway or against himself personally that he would use that and that would very much be used is, is that something that's used in the Mayo dressing room or, or used by other teammates uh, I'm guessing from your own kind of the way you look at things it won't be used by yourself but does that kind of stuff creep into the Mayo dressing room? I don't think so. Um, not from my experience, anyway. Mm. Um, so as you do when you're when you're building a team, you do want to build unity and and collectiveness and maybe brothership or whatever, and 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 bond the team together. I suppose some, yeah, be well known that some teams will put things up on the wall or whatever, you know, and try and kind of build that us against the world complex. But I don't know. I can't say I've ever seen that in a 
uh, in a Mayo dressing room, really. And I don't think it's part of the vibe. Maybe there are individuals that do that, um, but not to, not to my knowledge. Pe- people with scrapbooks and cuttings and all that kind of stuff looking through them. Looking <laughs> sure, re- there are. Re- sure, there are. Re- reddening of face in their, in their own sitting room just before heading out for training. Um, I have to ask you about that thing you did with Lee for, for Movember, which I think is in- incredibly important stuff. Uh, you went out and you spoke about your own... Uh, I, I guess encounters with mental health issues and you uh, opened up about going to see a counsellor and stuff like that towards the end of 2021 which I think is remarkably brave and you should be 100% commended for that how did you find that changed your approach or did it at all or did, did it just essentially act as a, a, a much needed release valve for yourself at the time yeah it was it was first of all it was a, an incredible piece and we were really really lucky to kind of be given the, the opportunity and funny enough, like I hadn't even spoken about that or had intentions of speaking about mm. that. So they didn't even, the, the team around November didn't even know about that, you know, and I was possibly somewhat reluctant to speak about it, but kind of went the way it went in the end. Um, but yeah, look, that was just my like little piece there. It's an ongoing thing for everybody. I think everybody, you know, we all have our physical health and our emotional and mental health and they like everything, they go up and down. Some days they're good, some days they're not. And, I just think it's really important kind of keep a check on it. Like, I wouldn't have said that I was really at the latter end of, of serious struggles. You know, I, I, I certainly wasn't, but I wasn't in a good place either, you know, and things had, things had started to go downhill and they were there for quite some time. And that cloud hadn't gone away, you know, as you would expect it to. So, yeah, look, I sought out a bit of help. I went and seen my GP thanks to... Thanks to a close friend, kind of giving me the giving me the push, which is really important. It's it is a really difficult thing to say. Um, I give this advice to people because I work in the mental health uh, area here in Mayo, so I do give this advice, but it's really hard to take it then. So um, yeah, friend pushed me a little bit, which I needed. Spoke to the GP, um, and yeah, started going back to back to counselling and even um, started on medication for a short term to just kind of alleviate some of the pressure. And it done just that, and it was. Continue the counselling still, uh, will continue it. I think it's very valuable. Um, and just the, the little message, I know I'm going on a bit, but so as a little message in it is you don't really have to wait until it is really, really, really hard. That's, you know, that really, was good. Really, That's where I was going to come in. I was going to say you, you don't have to wait until things are at an extreme for you to actually decide to take that step and, and go and speak to somebody or, or to reach out and to seek a bit of help. I think there's lots of people who would have done it, would have done it myself, whereby you just you reach a point where you kind of think, yeah, I actually do need to grab hold of this. And I think the fact that it didn't need to get to an extreme and that you did decide off your own bat with a little bit of help from a friend that this is something that needed talking about, that's, I think that's to be lauded and that, sh- that, should, be become, that should become more common uh, in that respect. Yeah, well, it's, it's simple terms, like, isn't it? You know, you, mm. you like have a little small fire burning and you, you know you need to put it out where you can go and get help and put it out or do we just let it fester mm. and it gets to the point where it gets out of control and then you're screaming for help, yeah. do you know? Then you, you're like, why, why, why wait until then? And I suppose society, especially Irish society, has kind of built that framework around us where we should be tough and resilient and, like, the most tough and resilient and honest thing you can do is actually ask for help, do you know? And it is a really, really difficult thing and I applaud anybody that does, but, mm. look, there are, there are so many avenues to do that now, um, so... Yeah, and you would have seen a lot of it yourself because, as you mentioned, there are you still working as the the social care assistant there with the Western Care uh, Association? And no, no, I, I moved on. Finished up with them after after seven or eight years there. Yeah. I work in youth justice um, in Balna and with Mayo Mental Health Association. So I um I work with a lot of uh, adolescents and um, then a lot of people from different diverse backgrounds and would see I suppose a lot of different kind of mental health issues and, and different bits and pieces but I'm lucky enough I get to do a lot of the community based stuff I get to go into the schools and, and and do bits and pieces like that and talk about these topics exactly and resilience and the importance for you know having conversations and, and doing bits and pieces like that so you're keeping busy essentially flat out flat to the mat <laughs> you never stop you need to give a chance for that injury to heal uh, uh, come here before you go I have to ask you because obviously it's been the tip of, of, of everyone's tongues the past few days this situation with Kilmacode and Glenn uh, just wondering for your own view on it how you saw things if indeed you did watch it on Sunday and how you think things will go over the next 24 hours yeah, I, like I'm the most ill-informed person <laughs> on this there was a brief conversation about it earlier and I had absolutely nothing I, I, I know so little about it there I Actually, I just don't watch football. Like I just don't. Um, 
got knocked out uh, by Lee and Westport in the county final yeah. in early December and I haven't looked at football since. You know, All I seen was a, a quick screenshot where somebody said there were 16 players on the pitch, didn't read an article, didn't look at it, don't really care, to be honest. Uh, I don't know what's going on with it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, do you watch... I don't know if to say, but it's true. Like. Well, that, that's fair enough. It's, 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 it's open and honest and that's that's your opinion on it and that's your that's your view on it is that you didn't see it and I'm not going to force an, an opinion out of you. Not point, there's not much point, you know, <laughs> sticking my oar in when I actually don't know anything about it. There's enough people that do that online. I'll leave it to them. Well, you know? that's 100% true as well. I, I'm, I'm just like, do you not watch anything else? Is there any sport that you do like to relax and watch, like aside from football, or is it once you're no, once you put the boots away, that's it for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll play anything. I'll play yeah. any form of sport, any way, shape, or form. But no, I don't watch it really. Um, my young buck is kind of he's in that like super era now where FIFA and soccer is life, like absolute yeah. life. So he's he's ten. So I do kind of watch a bit of that with him. Got a little bit caught into the World Cup, got a bit of bit going there. But yeah. besides that, like I've no no interest in it really. Might watch a little bit of basketball, but no, not yeah. really. Does does he does, so have you managed to actually play FIFA with the ten year old then and, and how badly does he beat you on a regular basis? Because I've got an eleven year old and I can't compete. Yeah, I'm like I'm on the fringes. Do you know when you're at the line? Yeah. When when you when you finally know, okay, it's coming. Like he's he's about to take over and there will be no coming back. That's where I'm at right now. I'm hanging on by yeah. dear life. <laughs> yeah, it's a scary it's a scary point uh, that I think we all reach in certain bleak parts bleak of our life. Yeah. It really, really is. Uh, listen, Porrig, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you. And of course, it's all been with thanks to Allianz and the start of the Allianz League, which return this weekend. Porrig O'Hara, uh, thanks so much for speaking to us this afternoon and this evening. And uh, our Gaelic football and off the ball is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Porrig,